So hear the word of the Lord today as it comes from Luke chapter 2. It's a familiar story, but try to hear it again for the first time. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went to the town, went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard as it had been told them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be to God. Be to God. So I will tell you that um, the sermon title is not a typo. Not a typo. All of my Christmas cards were addressed in calligraphy and sent out early this year. My house is beautifully decorated and might as well be featured in Southern Living Magazine. All holiday meals were shopped for and prepped well ahead of time and are both delicious and nutritious. Presents for my family have been carefully chosen since last January, ensuring the best price. This sermon has been written for weeks. Does anyone here believe this? <laughs> None of that is true. In fact, my Christmas seems a little bit off this year. My family won't be together until the 26th. Christmas cards are not ready and will probably be addressed during football games this afternoon if I can stay awake. I feel a cold coming on. The sermon wasn't done until about 5 a.m. yesterday morning. I overcommitted myself this season again. Yes, Karen. The truth is that Christmas is messy. The messiest for me, however, was Christmas Day 2002, when my family set off from Georgia on a car trip back to Texas. We were looking forward to being back in Texas, even if just for a little while. So we woke up really early Christmas morning, opened presents, ate breakfast, and loaded our car. After a late lunch, Jack and I, Taylor and Ali, and our two little dogs headed west on I-20, hoping to make it to Jackson, Mississippi to spend the night. We got to Tuscaloosa, Alabama about 7 p.m. and needing something to eat, we drove around several exits to find that everything was closed. Fast food, gas stations even, convenience stores, the Chinese Buffet Palace, which was our last best hope, were all dark. 
We were getting desperate with two little girls. We wasted almost an hour searching for something to eat. We were all hungry and tired and cranky when it seemed like we would find nothing. And just as we had about given up, we saw a light shining in the darkness. A neon sign was lit off the last exit, beckoning us to come closer. It was an eating establishment, and they were open. We had a good meal. The workers and customers were festive and friendly to us. But it was not the Christmas night meal that I had envisioned. My family enjoyed their Christmas night at Hooters. <laughs> if you knew me well, you would know that Hooters is the last place I would ever want to eat. Being against women parading around in scanty clothing, it's the last place I would want my husband and children to go. It's a scandalous place to be for any clergy person, male or female. God has a sense of humor, no doubt. It wasn't perfect. It was a Christmas night I never could have imagined. And yet, we were together. We had a good meal we had been provided for. We celebrated that God was with us in Jesus Christ. We were full of joy, and we still laugh about that night. Christmas was messy for Seth Myers this year. His holiday cards came with another family's name at the bottom by mistake. They read, Happy Holidays from Tom, Ellen, and Peanut. He admits that if it had just said Tom and Ellen, he would have been really mad, but the inclusion of Peanut made it hilarious to him. Is Peanut a pet? Probably. But maybe a small child or a living grandparent. Myers quip, the whole thing is a reminder that the true meaning of Christmas is that things go wrong. And you just have to roll with it. We cut off the bottom of our card. My heart is filled with joy as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. But my heart is also sad because last week, one of my dear friends from my former congregation, Jane Nolan, passed away. As I shared, there's a recent leukemia diagnosis in my family. I'm convinced that even in the beautiful home in Southern Living, some closet, if opened, will spill out all the junk that they're hiding, or some sadness that has found them. Christmas is messy. The state of our world today weighs heavy on my mind. Over 65 million people in our world have been forcibly displaced, and over 20 million are living outside their own country as refugees. Terrorism is a constant threat. There's a shooting every day. Somewhere. Our own country's more politically divided than ever, than ever, and it's against this backdrop that we will gather Tuesday night and sing joy to the world. The Lord is come. Christmas is messy. Luke tells us briefly of the trip that Joseph and Mary took on what is now known as the first Christmas. It still seems like such a simple and beautiful scene, the way Luke tells it. While they were there, time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger. We lay out the beautiful picture in our nativity scenes. But we have to know that's not really what it looked like. My friend Bill Harrison wrote about Jesus' royal birth this week in his blog. He reminds us, Mary and Joseph were undoubtedly covered with dust and sweat after an arduous journey and may or may not have had the chance to bathe or change clothes. They certainly had no deodorant or perfume and were staying in an environment that smelled of hay, manure, and donkey. He argues that we've lost a good bit of the full significance of the nativity in the way we celebrate them today. God was incarnated in very 
ordinary, everyday circumstances, totally dependent on his parents for care and feeding, as every baby is, crying as all babies do. Not a silent night, not calm, maybe bright. Come on, get real, Bill preaches. Marjorie Holmes, in her book, Two from Galilee, fills in what she imagines might be the messy details of this story. Listen and imagine what it might have been like for them. Joseph saw at once that the fears of these last torturous miles were to be realized. I'm sorry, said the innkeeper, we're full. But my wife's in labor. Joseph protested. She's about to bear a child. You've got to give us some shelter, at least for a few hours. But I can't, the innkeeper wheezed. Can't you see for yourself? There's simply no room. I'm sorry, lad, but I can't perform miracles. Miracle, Joseph thought in a flash of bitterness. Let the Lord produce one now. You must, Joseph repeated, you must help us. Well, there's a stable. It's full of creatures, but if you don't mind the stink and the noise, you can stay there. Joseph was heart sick as he hurried back to Mary. A stable, God had chosen him to look after her, and all he could supply was a cave with animals in it. Mary was in the grip of such pain now, there was no use apologizing. Come, Joseph said gently. The inn is full but I'll make you a soft bed on the hay in the stable. At the far end of the rocky path was the stable and inside was the smell of oats and the tang of animals tethered in semi-darkness. There was one lone manger, the straw in it rancid. Joseph found an empty stall, hung his lamp, cleaned out the manger and the stall, replacing old with fresh. He spread his outer cloak and helped Mary lie down on it. Thank God, she moaned softly. You must go and fetch a midwife, she panted. Yes, he said, I should have thought of that before. I should have inquired with the innkeeper. Again, he is shocked by his own appalling ineptitude. Fool, fool, he said to himself. He headed down the path until stopped by a scream too horrifying to believe. He whirled and ran back to Mary. Joseph, don't go. Don't leave me. Mary, Mary, he said as he cradled her in his arms. Oh, God, he thought you, God, if you're the one who performed this miracle, why are you doing this to Mary? Go and fetch some water, Mary instructed Joseph. You see, men were not allowed to be with women when giving birth, much less did they know what to do. Joseph got some water from the herdsmen around the fire in the inn's courtyard and returned to Mary, who lay writhing in pain. You must build a fire, she told him, and keep cloths warm to wrap the baby in. We need a knife, and you're going to have to dip it in the hot water before you cut. A knife, Joseph gasped his thoughts beginning to whirl around in his head. All these things, these rancid, improper human things, and Mary's swollen, swollen body before him, surely an angel would come down and deliver this baby without pain, without blood. Help me, cried Mary. Yet Joseph could not help her. It's all right, Mary, yell if you have to, I'm right here. Joseph bent near in love and reverence. And to their surprise, Joseph told her, I can see his little head. There was a great ripping and flooding and burning and Mary and her son was born. Joseph lifted him up for Mary to see and as they looked together, they marveled. 
When he squirmed in Joseph's arms and uttered his first cry, the thrill of all mankind ran through them because they knew, they knew a miracle had just happened. The pain was past and ecstasy flooded them both. Joseph cleaned off the baby and rubbed him with salt as Mary directed. And now she held the baby, dozing, while Joseph tidied up the nest that had become their home, replacing bloody straw with fresh. How beautiful this place looked to him now. It wasn't long before shepherds, yes, shepherds, the lowest class in society came to celebrate with them. And yet these shepherds and their sheep had been told good news of the birth of a savior and serenaded by millions, millions of angels. The first Christmas was messy. God was born in the flesh and angels sang announcing his coming. He was born like we all were, into a time rolled by an oppressive emperor in a stable under a motel, to a couple displaced from their home, surrounded by scandal, in imminent danger from an insanely, insanely jealous ruler. It is into such mess that God is born into stables and corruption, into Bethlehem and San Diego, into illness and anxiety, exhaustion and sorrow, into uncertainty and fear, into loneliness and helplessness, into unemployment and workaholism, for families and single people, for those considered worthless, and for those put on pedestals to which they can never live up. Don't worry if your life isn't perfect. No life is. Jesus is born anyway, bringing such love and peace, such hope and joy that even in the midst of all our mess, we pause to notice and wonder, to worship and bow down, to sing and pray and celebrate together. It is also into such mess that those of us who believe this story are sent in the name of Jesus. We're sent to the hungry and homeless, the poor and oppressed, the sick and the dying to help and heal, to deliver the love and peace, hope and joy Jesus brings so that one day everyone will notice and wonder worship and bow down, sing and pray and celebrate his coming. You know, if you think about it, there's no need for Jesus to come where it's perfect. It's into our messy world that God desires to come. And so I wish you a messy Christmas so that Christ can be born in you in your messy family, in your messy job or schoolwork, in your messy home, and your messy life. He will bring all the hope, peace, joy, and love that no earthly mess can take away. Amen. 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 Thank you.